Hello and welcome to India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines that we're tracking for you this evening, the Sensex and the Nifty News, nearly 5% this week, the biggest fall in over two years. Nearly 18 lakh crore rupees of investor wealth wiped out in the last five days. Foreign investors pumped nearly $15 billion into Chinese stocks this week. That's 90% of all investments into emerging markets in the last five days. India sees FIR outflows worth $4.4 billion in the last five days. However, many say it's too early to call time on India's bull market. Powerful blast rock Beirut as Israel targets the Hezbollah headquarters and its new leader in a fresh escalation. Iran's supreme leader says Hezbollah and Hamas will not back down. Crude oil prices edge higher with Brent nearing the $80 mark. India's top lenders issue mixed updates in Q2. HDFC Bank shores up deposits with a 15% growth. Bajaj Finserv has seen a 13% rise in new loans but m and Finance reports a 1% decline in loan disbursements. The RBM Monetary Policy Committee with three new members will meet next week to decide on key policy rates. A CNBC TV 18 Citizens Monetary Policy Committee expects a status quo, but a majority expect a change in stance to facilitate rate cuts in the near future. The government is committed to reducing fiscal deficit to 4.9% this financial year, says the Finance Minister, promises to nearly double the per capita income within five years. External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar is set to attend Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in Pakistan this month. Will be his first visit to Pakistan. The last Indian Foreign Minister to visit, visit Pakistan was the late Sushma Swaraj in 2015. All 90 Assembly seats in Haryana go to the polls tomorrow. The BJP aims for a hat trick while the Congress looks to end the decade long power drought. Ahmadli Party Dushyan Chautala and Abhay Chautala hoping to play kingmakers. Results will be announced on the 8th of October. Also on the show is the quick commerce boom hurting supermarkets in Kirana stores, a special report coming up. As always, let's start with the market action and there was simply no respite for the bulls on the large street today. The sell-off continued with the Sensex and the Nifty losing nearly 1% today and 5% for the week. This marks the biggest weekly decline in over two years. All sectoral indices closing in the red. The Sensex down 800 points, the Nifty down by about 250, 550 down on the mid cap and the Nifty bank lost about almost 400 points today. The metal index was the sole index that closed higher. The Nifty managing to cling on to the 25,000 mark though. Prashant is standing by now to wrap up the market action. It's been a tough week, Prashant, for our markets. A large down day once again. If you thought that yesterday was bad, well, today was not worse, but uh, it didn't give you any relief whatsoever. The market ended down about 200 points lower on the Nifty, which means for the week, I mean, the market, by the way, is down a little over 4%. I think it's the worst week we've had since the beginning of the year. Uh, the Nifty Bank had it much better. It was down just about 0 0.5, 0 0.6%. Of course, that lost a lot uh, more uh, in terms of uh, trade yesterday. Mid-cap index uh, for the week was down 3%. For the day, we were down about 0.8% uh, or so. I'll start with, uh, you know, the large cap. Actually, you know, sectorally speaking, uh, there, was, there were only two areas which ended higher, PSU banks and the IT services space. And ID stocks, of course, will be first off the block in terms of reporting earnings. Uh, I'll start with what was down in terms of nifty names. Mahindra and Mahindra was down 3.5%. Nestle was down 3%. Bajaj Finance was down 3 Hero Motor Corp was down 3 2.5%. BPCL, Asian Paints, Britannia, Ultratech Cements. These are all 2% plus cuts that we had in terms of uh, trade. On the upside, as I said, tech was higher. Infosys, HDFC Life and ONGC were the three sole, uh, three 1% uh, plus gainers that we had uh, by the end of it. Lots of losers, two is to one clean declines to advances ratio, more down than up. What was down biggest with volumes, Adani Energy, uh, uh, that, that is Adani, Adani Energy Solutions, number one volume led loser. Reliance Power was down five, Godrish Properties, Mahindra and Mahindra Finance, business update stock smashed 7%. Reliance Infra had a one-way rally, 8% lower. You had a KRN Energy Heat Exchanges, which is the recent listing down 6%. Chumbal Fertilizer, Amber Enterprises, K Fintech Solutions, PC Jewelers, and a few others uh, as well. On the upside, you had names like Oil India. I mean, big move in oil prices last two days. VIP Industries was a gainer, 8% big move. And there were names like Home First, which ended up about 5.5% as well. Tough week, the toughest we've had since the beginning of the year, as I said and markets still waiting on the edge for what comes out of Middle East. Will we see developments over the weekend? I think that's the big question. Back to you.
Prashant, many thanks. Well, tough week indeed. And foreign institutional investors are hot on China, at least for now. Market watchers say that a slew of stimulus measures announced by China's central bank last month are resulting in tactical money flowing into the country. In fact, close to 90% of what FI has invested into emerging market equities this week has gone into China. Chinese equities have seen inflows of close to $14 billion, its second highest amount on record. Meanwhile, FII sold Indian equities worth $4.4 billion this week on a net basis. However, it's too early to call time on India's bull market. That is the unequivocal message from experts that we've been speaking to. Hormuz is standing by now. Hormuz, FII is, uh, well, looking at China again, China recovering, but India is still very much in the game. You know, these last few days, the fall that we have witnessed in the Indian markets, one of the biggest factors has been the relentless selling from the FIIs in the Indian, in the cash markets. Yesterday was one such incident, almost $2 billion worth of selling. There have been many analysts who have come up and said that money is moving out of India into the Chinese markets. And the graphic that comes up on your screen now will be proof of that. Before going into the holiday season, the Chinese markets, the CSI 300 index between the eight to the 30th of September that nine trading sessions that they had the index was up 27% from almost at a 52 week low jumping to a 52 week high during this period in contrast over the last four sessions ever since the nifty made a record high last Thursday since then the index is already down 4% from those levels a thousand points down on the nifty and the fall in the broader markets has been much worse so there has been an outflow of money into the Chinese markets but is this the start of a bull run in China and not so much in the Indian markets. Well, not many on the street are convinced about this rally in the Chinese markets and Rajiv Jain of GQG is one of them. And he mentions very clearly that how many times in the last three years we have seen this excitement only for it to pater out in the months ahead. And he also mentions that if this party in the Chinese markets goes on without them, they are fine with it. And that's because Rajiv Jain in his funds have been underweight on the Chinese markets. And he said that this is a trade, a good trade at that. But is it investable for a three, four, five year period? That is questionable. City came out with a note and they mentioned that the CSI 300, as I just highlighted, was up almost 30% during this session. Multiple policy announcements that were supportive of this rally in China. China. But this recent outperformance has made sure that the Chinese markets have caught up with India in terms of performance. And this, But in the Indian markets, the strong macro outlook and the flows from domestic investors will ensure that the markets remain resilient going forward as well. And Gavekal Research also came out with a view. They said that even if this China rally sustains, many foreign investors are reluctant and they remain reluctant to invest there. And the headwinds in China will become tailwinds for the Indian markets going forward. And although they put in a caveat saying that while these foreign investors may find better value in terms of a lot of other emerging markets compared to India, but it is too early to call time on India's bull market. Actually, I don't think it's a bad thing if China market does well for us, as in mostly for India. It is not bad for India per se. I don't think that beyond some shorter term thing, investors have to sell India to buy China. Because India, I don't think in aggregate, people are over overweight. They might be 1% plus minus overweight. So if you were underweight China, that would have come from the rest of the world. India and China, even an emerging market fund combined would be say 20 and 25, 26 now. So half the investment of people who are able to move this around is in non-India, non-China. So don't call time yet on the bull market that we're seeing in India. Now, the U.S. has added far more jobs than projected in September, and the unemployment rate has dropped unexpectedly. 254,000 jobs were added in September. That's as per the country's Labor, Labor Department. And this is the highest number of job additions since February. Meanwhile, unemployment has dipped to 4.1% with the labor force participation rate remaining steady at 62.7%. So that's good news coming in for the U.S. administration ahead of the elections.
the big global story that we continue to track. Powerful blasts rocked Lebanon's capital, Beirut, as Israel targeted the Hezbollah headquarters and its potential new leader. These strikes come amidst Iran's foreign minister's visit to Beirut. The Lebanese health ministry said around 37 people were killed, 151 wounded in the past 24 hours. Israel claims that two rockets were launched from Lebanon towards Haifa, an important port city in Israel. Both these rockets were intercepted. Hezbollah said its fighters bombed a military base in northern Israel. However, no deaths were reported. The Israeli army ordered residents of 20 towns in southern Lebanon to evacuate immediately, hinting at a potential escalation of ground operations. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini delivered his first sermon in five years. Khomeini called for the bel belt of Muslim unity to be tightened and said that Iran's attack on Tel Aviv was the minimum punishment for Israel's crimes. And staying with tensions in West Asia, at least 18 people have been killed as Israel struck a refugee camp in West Bank. Israeli military claims to have killed a local Hamas leader during the strike. The UN Agency for Refugees confirmed that at least 21 Palestinians have been killed in three school shelters in Gaza over the last two days. Over 41,000 Palestinians have been killed and over 96,000 have been injured since the war began nearly a year ago. The 7th of October will mark one year of the Hamas attack on Israel and the war in Gaza. From one war-torn region to another, at least three people, including a six-year-old girl, were killed after Russian drones hit a truck delivering gas cylinders to houses in Ukraine. A Russian glide bomb struck a five-story apartment block in northeastern Kharkiv, injuring 12 people. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry said it intercepted 113 Ukrainian drones over four Russian regions on the border with Ukraine. Crude oil prices continue to inch higher amidst the tensions in West Asia. Brent crude has gone from $70 at the start of October to more than $77 in just four days. However, brokerages believe the gains will be capped as weak demand outlook continues to weigh on prices. Now, Finance Minister Nimla Sitaraman says the government is committed to reducing the fiscal deficit and has estimated to bring it down to 4.9% in FY25. Speaking at the Cotillia Economic Conclave, the finance minister promised to nearly double the per capita income within five years. Our government continues to uphold its commitment to reducing the fiscal deficit. Aided by buoyant revenue generation, restrained revenue expenditure growth, and healthy economic activity, the fiscal deficit is, is estimated to decline further from 5.6% of GDP in FY24, I'm basing on provisional actuals, to 4.9% in FY25. The decline in commodity prices has facilitated the lowering of the budget allocation for subsidies on fertilizer and fuel. India seeks to double its per capita income in a matter of few years for its 1.4 billion population which makes up uh, about 18% of the global total. In a fragmented and fractured world, where several persistent conflicts may worsen, posing a threat to global peace that is the bedrock for prosperity. To reach a per capita income of 2,730 US dollars, as per IMF projections, it will take only five years to add another 2,000 US dollars. Well, that's the finance minister. Now, the government is working on a larger restructuring package for Rashtra Ispatnigam Limited, the corporate entity running the Vizag steel plant. Sapna joins us now with exclusive details. Sapna, take us through the government's restructuring plan. Well, as we had reported earlier as well, uh, indicating that a restructuring package is underway for RINL or Vizag Steel's revival, that's exactly uh, you know what uh, is being reiterated. Uh, importantly enough, we are also able to understand that the government has decided internally that uh, RINL should be kept as a going concern. The company should not be allowed to shut down. Uh, also given to understand that uh, the overall uh, dues uh, that the company owes to various vendors as well as banks is a massive number of around 12, uh, of around 38,500 crores, out of which around uh, 18,500 crores is what the company owes to the banks alone. So we are now given to understand that just last month some 1140 crores worth of uh, loan has been arranged 
to prevent RINL from becoming an NP account. That's one. Another 500 crores of uh, worth of an emergency grant has been grant has been given by the government to the company so that it's able to actually pay pay off its uh, GST dues. I mean, the situation at RINL is so bad that uh, you know they're absolutely out of liquidity and they didn't have money to even clear GST dues, uh, which is why the sales could not happen. So keeping all of this in mind. Uh, a larger restructuring and revival plan for RINL is in the works. Most likely, the concerned ministries and departments will be seeking a cabinet nod by December. Sapna, many thanks. Now, India's top lenders have reported Q2 updates that paint a mixed picture. Bajaj Finance reported a 13% rise in new loans. Assets under management have seen a growth of 29%, with the customer base increasing by over 20%. M&M Finance reported a 20% growth in assets, but loan disbursements were down over a percent, even as liquidity increased by over 6%. Shares of HDFC Bank rose in early trade after the company reported a 15% rise in deposits. Term deposits have seen a rise of over 19% and assets under management are up over 8%. The private lender has also released its shareholding pattern for September quarter. The bank has indicated that its FII headroom remains safely above the 20% mark. According to Nuvama Research, the bank is expected to attract $1.8 billion next month as MSCI is likely to increase its weightage in its index. Navi Finserb reported a 27% rise in dispersals and a 26% in assets under management for FY24, but interest income from loans has declined 12% despite high interest rates being offered. Provisions have seen a sharp rise of 25%. The company's employee expense is also down nearly 50%, which is not unusual for a fintech business. Now, in a bid to expand its India footprint, iPhone maker Apple is planning to add four more retail stores in Bengaluru, Pune, Delhi, NCR and Mumbai. According to reports, the stores are expected to open next year. The retail expansion comes on the back of strong sales in its Delhi and Mumbai flagship stores. Apple has also confirmed it has started making the entire iPhone 16 lineup in India. Well, the story we are waiting for. The RBI Monetary Policy Committee with three new members will meet next week to decide on key policy rates. The CNBC TV 18 Citizens Monetary Policy Committee expects a status quo on rates, but a majority expect a change in stance to neutral, which will facilitate rate cuts in the near future. Let's take a look. What will the Reserve Bank and the MPC do to rates? Let me start with you, Sajid. Uh, hold rates. They'll pause. Hold. Okay, hold. Uh, Shomyo? Yes. Hold. Okay, Sonal? They should cut 25 basis point. Ah, here's the first cut. Uh, Samiran? Uh, no change. Three is to one, sir, uh, in favour of hold. Dr. Uh, Chairman? Hold. Hold. Okay, so it's four is to one in favour of holding the policy. Change of stance. Will the MPC change its stance from the current withdrawal of accommodation? Sajid? Change to neutral. Oh, okay. Uh, Sonal? Change to neutral. Obviously, you are voted for a cut. Uh, Samiran? Uh, hold on to the stance. Hold. It's uh, going to be a close call. Okay. Shaumyo? We'll hold on to the stance. Okay. Two holds, two change to neutral. Dr. Sen? Change to neutral. Change to neutral. I think your members are veering to your point of view. Uh, now, the final question, when do you see the first rate cut? Sajid? We're looking at December. Okay. Uh, Sonal, I think yours is October, right? Yes. October. You already said that. Samiran, your first rate cut? Uh, February or April. Okay. Shomyo? February. Uh, Dr. Sen? Yeah, I would go with February or April. Okay. So there you are, uh, the majority expecting the first rate cut only next calendar. But uh, there are at least two people dissenting and one expecting a cut right to be makes it a very interesting policy. Well, that's the Citizens MPC. And do stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. We'll bring you all the action on what the MPC delivers as its verdict right here. Up next on India Business Hour, the quick commerce boom hurt supermarkets and Kirana stores. Well, a special report coming up. External Affairs Minister S. Jai Shankar will visit Pakistan for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit from the 15th to 16th of October. This is the first time in nearly a decade that an Indian foreign minister will visit Pakistan. The summit is expected to focus on financial, economic, socio-cultural and humanitarian cooperation among the SCO member states. 
Haryana all set to go to the polls tomorrow. More than a thousand candidates are in the race for 90 assembly seats. Results will be declared on the 8th of October. The polls will see a direct contest between the BJP and the Congress, while other parties could play kingmaker in case of a hung assembly. The BJP, which replaced Manohar Al Khattar with Nayab Saini as the chief minister in March this year, is eyeing a hat trick. The Congress, meanwhile, is looking to end its decade long power drought in the state. The party won five out of ten Haryana seats in the Lok Sabha elections. The Supreme Court has ordered an independent investigation into the alleged adulteration of laddus at the Tirupati Temple. The independent special investigative team headed by the CBI director will replace the SIT formed by the Andhra Pradesh government under Chandababu Naidu. The Apex Court maintained that an independent investigation was needed to assuage the hurt sentiments of crores of devotees. The SIT will comprise of two CBI officers, two officers from Andhra Pradesh, police chosen by the state government and one member of the food regulator, the FSSAI. The central government has opposed the outright classification of marital rape as rape. In an affidavit submitted to the Supreme Court, the centre said that the use of the term rape is excessively harsh in the context of marriage and could destabilise the delicate balance of conjugal relationship. Arguing against the criminalisation of marital rape, the centre said non-consensual acts within marriage already attract penal consequences under the Domestic Violence Act and other provisions. The centre is also of the belief that the matter is more social than legal and any decision on criminalising marital rape must be made by the legislature and not the judiciary. IPO-bound Swiggy has received shareholders not to increase the size of the primary issue of its public issue. As per a money control report, the food aggregator platform will raise the size from 3,750 crore rupees to 5,000 crore rupees. The report says that Swiggy has created a provision for a larger IPO size in case the company requires additional funds. However, the offer for sale component will remain unchanged at over 6,000 crore rupees. Supermarkets and Kirana stores are feeling the heat as more people get hooked to quick commerce apps, especially for grocery needs. Take the case of DMART, one of India's biggest supermarkets. Its revenue growth per store has been declining over the last few quarters. However, experts say that Kirana stores would be the worst hit by the quick commerce storm. Shilpa Rani Peta joins us now. Shilpa, quick commerce moving up the queue when it comes to Indian shoppers' grocery needs. What does this mean for modern trade? Now we have been talking about the impact that quick commerce is having on e-commerce and on Kirana stores but it seems to be pinching modern trade as well and the numbers recently that have come out from DMART's second quarter update reflect some of this. Now if you look at the sales per store that came in just about 1% and even the revenue per store slowed down to about 2.2% as against a 5.3 and a 5.8% growth that it has seen in the last two quarters. Now while we are awaiting more clarity on why there was a slowdown in growth for DMART some analysts have attributed this to the rapid rise and competition coming in from quick commerce players. Now, in a recent report, DMART CEO had said that it could see a 1-2% to possible impact from quick commerce in markets like Mumbai and that it doesn't have any Q-commerce plans but instead it will look at expanding its stores and opening them, opening them in catchments where quick commerce demand is high. Now, this, you know, sort of demonstrate that, demonstrates that modern trade also is seeing a shift, uh, uh, is, is seeing a shift when it comes to quick commerce where consumers are now shifting their monthly grocery purchases also onto apps like Swiggy, Instamart, Blinkit, etc. Now, a recent report by Nielsen IQ sort of captures this where it says that 20% of offline shoppers are now buying their grocery needs online whereas these uh, consumers would have otherwise gone to, gone to a DMART or another supermarket to buy these, uh, uh, to do this shopping. 31% shoppers are relying on quick commerce for their main grocery needs while as 31 are relying Relying on it for top-up purchases. The whole idea of quick commerce was that consumers will buy their last-minute essentials or do top-up purchases but it seems like the shift has now happened to main grocery shopping also. In fact, 60% of the shoppers are buying their monthly essential staples online and what this means is this shift means that there are uh, there is business going away from modern trade and from grocery stores where a, a shopper would have otherwise gone to the store. But the impact, let me tell you, is higher, much higher on Kirana stores than on supermarkets because the report says that 32% of shoppers are still visiting supermarkets because they still have a value proposition of a wider product assortment, better shopping experience and so Kirana stores, unless they up their game, will see a larger impact whereas modern, modern trade will see a pinch but consumers will still go to these stores. Back to you. 
Shilpa, many thanks. Now, the pilot project of the Prime Minister's internship scheme has been officially launched with 111 companies on board. Sources have told us that Mahindra and Mahindra, Alembic Pharma and Max Life Insurance are leading the initiative. The pilot will be implemented across seven districts in Maharashtra, Uttarakhand, Telangana and Gujarat. The Mahindra Group has said it is the first to load internship profiles on the internship portal with 2,100 interns in Phase 1. Prime Minister Modi spoke about the launch of the internship scheme at the Kotilia Economic Conclave this evening. इस साल के बजट में हमने करोड़ों युवाओं की स्किलिंग और इंटर्नशिप के लिए स्पेशल पैकेज अनाउंस किया है पीएम इंटर्नशिप स्कीम के तहत पहले दिन ही 111 कंपनियों ने पोर्टल पर रजिस्टर किया है इस स्कीम के तहत हम एक करोड़ युवाओं को बड़ी कंपनियों में internship mein madad kar rahe well, that is the Prime Minister. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. But before we go, India's most coveted leadership awards are back. The jury for the 20th edition of the India Business Leader Awards will meet in Mumbai. On the 7th of October, India's top business leaders will be part of a jury that picks the best in business, sport, entertainment and other leaders from different walks of life. So, Remember to tune in. We'll be joined by veteran industrialist Baba Kalyani. As the jury gears to deliberate on the winners, you can catch Zarin Daruwala, Ashok Paswani, SBI, CS Sethi, and many others, including Asian Paints, Amit Singhal, Sunita Reddy, KV Subramaniam of Federal Bank, Kunal Behel, Kartik Reddy of Bloom Ventures, Ravi Kumar, and R. Shankar Raman will make up the India Business Leader Awards jury. Do remember to tune in on Monday to catch the action.